Myers here with uh, Delegate John Bohannon, and uh, we're doing a series of interviews for the upcoming Maryland General Assembly session. I'm going to find out from John what his predictions are for the session. Um, I guess the budget's going to be on everybody's mind. As it has been for the last uh, several years, the budget will kind of dominate uh, the issues. Uh, although the last session we got a little bit more into some social issues, but uh, the budget is again going to be a challenge due to the slow recovery of the economy. So, um, are uh, tax increases on the horizon? Some are proposing that. <coughs> um, there is talk about a possible gas tax. There's talk about some other possible taxes. Uh, I'll say this, Nick. There's always some somebody proposing you know, it'd be nice to have new revenues and new source of revenues and uh, we should increase this tax or that tax. Um, the biggest one would be the, uh, the gas tax has been talked about, but we'll see. What's your position on that? <coughs> uh, I'm taking a wait and see attitude. My natural inclination is to say no, we have a lot of commuters down here. It would cripple a lot of folks who were struggling right now and I'm very sensitive to that. The other part that I do worry about is uh, everybody knows the need for the Thomas Johnson replacement bridge and we have other, other needs and quite frankly we have a situation in Maryland where we're not bringing in nearly enough revenue to cover the road projects now. We committed to two major projects in the last 10 years that frankly we didn't have the revenue to, uh, to support and that was the ICC uh, which is was estimated to be over a billion dollars it's I think close to three billion now right. and then the upgrade of Route 95 which uh, few people people sort of forget about that one that was a project that um, didn't really benefit a lot of folks in Maryland might have benefited you if you were going from New Jersey down to North Carolina. You know, it's a th it's our main corridor through the state. Right. But it was a major over a billion dollar upgrade to a road system that, uh, if you talk to Marylanders, you know, very few people take that road, if anybody. So if um, um, a portion of the gas tax was um, committed to the TJ Bridge, would that make things a little bit easier for you? Here's the dilemma that we have. All of us, some members of the Southern Maryland delegation have already stood up with the pledge, I'm not supporting any gas tax, et cetera, et cetera. And that's fine. But as other areas of the state, if, if and when we uh, look at highway revenues, transportation revenues, uh, those jurisdictions all have a long list, just like we do with the Thomas Johnson Bridge, Guess who's going to get funded first? Yeah. And it's kind of difficult to go up and say, uh, well, we need this, we need that, but uh, we don't want to help pay for it. Um, so I'm keeping my eye, uh, keeping my options open at this point, but uh, uh, let me just make it very clear. Nobody needs an, another 15-cent gas tax. Uh, there are some who say, well, maybe we could have a nickel or something like that. We haven't raised the gas tax in many, many years. One of the problems that we have is uh, it doesn't keep up with inflation. So we've, uh, we haven't adjusted it for quite a while. There have been a couple of recommendations. One made back in the uh, early 2000s. The governor at the time took another tact and uh, didn't choose to do that. And yet we spent like we had done it with those two projects uh, that I said. And we really did not have the revenue. We're still paying for those two projects. And, you know, people talk about uh, raiding the transportation trust fund and all that. That's where a lot of our money has, has come from, is paying for the ICC in Montgomery County and then paying for the Route 95 upgrade uh, to the east side of Baltimore. Do we have enough money um, in the budget to keep up with maintenance? Barely. Uh, if you've noticed, Maryland traditionally, as compared to Virginia, as compared to Pennsylvania, even Delaware, especially New Jersey, has always ranked much better in terms of the condition of our highways. Uh, 
we're beginning to draw pretty even in terms of uh, uh, you know the pothole factor. Uh -huh. um, local roads, we've cut back significantly on our uh, amount of grant funding that goes to local jurisdictions, to counties, and the state highway itself has been stretching out. If you notice, the medians out here are not cut quite as often during the summer. Uh, the overlays, you know, new blacktop uh, doesn't occur nearly as frequently as it used to. So our roads are beginning to show that wear and tear. There is talk of an uh, increase in uh, flush tax, too. I assume that would not be, that would be uh, dedicated monies that would, would go to a Chesapeake Bay improvement. Um, do you believe that that is, is something that's going to... There's going to be a strong push for that. Um, we have a lot of work to do in, in the sense of uh, people believe that we could just triple, uh, double or triple the amount that we pay. Currently, if you have a septic system, we have $30 added to your property tax bill. Uh, there's some discussion that we need to double that or triple that uh, in order to pay for the upgrades that need to be done to the sewage treatment plants around the, the bay. And some of it goes for uh, upgrading your septic systems too, but not nearly enough. The big issue that I have is if you're going to ask folks who are on septic to double or triple the amount that they're contributing, what do they get in return? The answer is going to be a cleaner bay, but it needs to be uh, we also are going to help support you when you need to replace your, sept uh, your own septic system. Is there a movement afoot to um, limit septic systems? In the there are those who would significantly curtail the amount of development that we do uh, allowing septic systems to be uh, uh, the, the method for sewage disposal. Um, you really cannot do that in many rural areas of the state. You can do that in an urban system where you have the infrastructure to tie everybody into a central sewage system. We don't have that luxury here. And uh, as I've pointed out to many of my colleagues, much of the BRAC growth that we have experienced since, two, since the early 1990s uh, would not have been allowed to occur if we had those kind of stringent rules in place. Therefore, we would have miss the opportunity for significant job growth, not just in our region, but frankly, uh, for the entire state of Maryland. What would be the mechanism of that? Would that be through Plan Maryland? Or? Plan Maryland is sort of the mechanism that most people point to. Plan Maryland has been uh, essentially in effect for a long time, as everybody knows. Um, how you how aggressive you are in uh, driving some of those policies is sort of what's what's at, uh, uh, in question. Um, does it, does the does legislature have a dog in that fight? Ironically, no. At this point, this is a law that's been on the books for over thirty years. Mm -hmm. uh, the governor announced the other day that they plan to formally implement some portions of Plan Maryland, and there are a lot of folks who are uh, really worried about that. If you look at many of the tenants of it, um, they are policies that we've been dealing with or living with for, for quite some time now. Uh, you know, growth is pushed to the priority funding areas. Growth is pushed into the development districts. If a county designates a certain area for growth, then that's where the priority, f the state funding grants and, and whatnot are going to be prioritized to go to those regions. It's pretty much as simple as that. Um, now, it affects us more than it does other areas. The whole concept is you've got a lot of infrastructure investment in certain areas. People want to sort of leave those areas and come out to the 
newer, more rural settings, you know, it's, it's designed to take advantage of existing uh, infrastructure. So are the county's concerns there unfounded? No, I wouldn't, I would, no, not at all. <clears throat> We're going to work very closely. There's a group of us in the House who, <clears throat> frankly, been working with the governor for a couple of years on uh, moving development out in these areas ahead and sort of thwarting the forces who say absolutely no development, no further development out in the rural areas. Uh, you can't do that. And you've got to have some some semblance of, uh, or some balance that uh, makes sense. Do you think the governor has heard that concern? I, I think he clearly has. Uh, we met with him two years ago proposing a uh, more of a fast track kind of process uh, using uh, or taking the state agencies and kind of having them work more with the development community um, just to lay out the rules. One of the problems that you hear often from the development community is just tell us what the rules are and we'll go with them. But when you get mixed messages on exactly what's, uh, uh, what they're supposed to be doing, that's when they get very frustrated, understandably. Okay. Um, I understand there's now a redistricting map out that would change the configuration of your district, um, probably not drastically, but some. Released last Friday, uh, the governor's um, advisory committee put the map out. It's, it's online. Pretty good interactive uh, system. You can actually plug your address in and find out exactly where you would end up. And uh, I actually, for the first time, was spending a little bit of time over the weekend and yesterday kind of looking at those maps to see where they got finalized. Um, the speaker had a task force that uh, worked on the redistricting, and I was in charge of the rural areas, so I had a good sense of what was happening here and in other areas. But uh, for St. Mary's County, as most people know, we're the, we have been the fastest growing county for the last decade, and this is an adjustment after a one decade period. Every 10 years, we have to adjust the uh, legislative boundaries. So for mine, 29B, it's sort of the southern tip of St. Mary's County. And we had, uh, in my sub-district, I think I had the third uh, highest number over the ideal total. So we had to get rid of 12, we were about 12,000 people over. Mm -hmm. So that meant one thing, you know, when you're on a peninsula, uh, there's not much you can do other than shrink, and that's pretty much what we did. I used to come right up to the town of Leonardtown right around Riken High School. And now that uh, <clears throat> a whole swath in the middle part of the county has been uh, lopped off of 29B, uh, my district, and included in a, uh, a, a new uh, version of 29C, which uh, is the part that uh, was lower Calvert County and then Esperanza, Town Creek, and some of Hollywood. How part of that was part of what is now going to 29C used to also be 29A, is it? Right. Uh, yeah, that is correct. The, 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 uh, although, the, not a lot. Most of it has been, most of what makes the new 29C came out of 29B. It was sort of the 12,000 overage that, uh, that we had. Did you gain some territory? Shrunk geographically. some part of Town I, Creek? I, no, I didn't. Um, I pick up Pax River. Pick up Pax River. Okay. Naval Air Station. Which isn't that, is that, I mean, it's, it's not that many people. It's less than, uh, it's, I think, less than 200 people. Yeah. But I mean, uh, I guess psychologically, uh, that, that, that might be nice for you. Yeah, I, I wanted to, yeah, uh -huh. to do that. It's always, uh, you know, it's, it's obviously important to me. It's uh, the work that I do. You, um, for the people that don't know, you work for Congressman Hoyer, and you do a lot of work with, with Pat Trevor, I guess. I've been with him uh, 18 years now, um, and my principal responsibility has been to interface with the United States Navy at Pax River and at Indian Head, and uh, we've worked.
very uh, closely over the years on making sure PAX is safe, uh, safeguarded from BRAC and safeguarded from uh, other influences that might take work out of here and work hard to bring things here. Mm -hmm. Do you have any bills that you're planning on introducing that may be uh, uh, you know, out of the norm that maybe have been requested by uh, constituents? The, um, the only bill that I will probably look at, I'm looking at a couple of bond bills. Uh, I've consistently done those, and they've been very helpful to uh, various organizations. Cedar Lane, the 4-H group over at the um, uh, fairgrounds when they lost the building due to the collapse of the roof and the snow, we were able to help get them a bond bill to rebuild. Um, Colored Troops Memorial down at the Lancaster Park. Um, the, there have been several, many organizations over the years uh, come and they don't quite have enough of their own money to make a project happen. If we can provide them with a little bit of seed money, uh, for instance, hospice, you know, when they built a new home, uh, there are many good organizations in this community who just need a little bit of seed money that will attract other sources of money, private sources, sometimes federal grants and different things. Uh, Tudor Hall, for instance, you can name a long list right. of uh, great projects, summer seed, and uh, different ones who have benefited from uh, uh, bond bill over the years. Does the legislature know what the pot of money is going to be for bond bills? It has been about $15 million, which gets evenly split, so $7.5 million for the state, I mean for the House, 7 and a half for the Senate. Spread out throughout the uh, spread throughout the state, typically. That's significantly lower than it used to be. I assume. It's been that level. Frankly, it was down to about twelve, and then we took it up to fifteen for the last two or three years. So it's been pretty fairly consistent. So. Teacher pensions. Sure. What's going to happen? Um, big push from the Senate to shift teacher pensions to the counties uh, for the last couple of years. Uh, the House has kind of been the backstop to prevent that from happening. Rather than do a wholesale shift, we took a comprehensive approach a couple of years, well, last, the year before last, and uh, did some major pension reforms. Uh, those pension reforms have been uh, uh, beneficial some would argue a little bit painful. Teachers have to contribute an extra 2% and whatnot. But in the end, it's what we needed to do in order to shore up our teacher pension uh, obligations and, and commitments. Most import, uh, importantly, we retained a defined benefit as opposed to a defined contribution. And that's very key, and I think most teachers recognize that that's, uh, that, that is important. So what will happen? Uh, we'll continue to look at that. We are, um, we're, s I think, one of only three states that pays 100% of teacher uh, pensions. And for the state of Maryland, that has been, I, I say to my friends in Annapolis who rail all the time about runaway spending in Annapolis, here's a clear example of it. Uh, one year when our budget was declining, when for the first time in as far as anybody could remember, in over 50 years, we had less money coming in than we had the year before, so we had negative budget growth. That portion of our budget was growing by 21%. Uh, that was a couple of years ago, probably three years ago now. It continues to grow in the double digits, uh, although the, the um, pension reform changes have lowered that and it's becoming a lot more manageable now. It's still a fast growing sector or a fast growing piece of our budget. It is a piece of our budget that will, I point this out to folks, it will soon eclipse the amount that we invest in operating the university system of Maryland. State taxpayers give 1.1 billion dollars to the university system of Maryland. Uh, in order to run that enterprise, it ultimately is a four and a half billion dollar enter enterprise. But teacher contribution—I mean, uh, the teacher pensions—are soon going to be costing 
state taxpayers over a billion dollars a year just to fund and meet that obligation that we have to uh, retired teachers, which is important. But uh, it, again, I point out we're one of only three states that, uh, that pays 100% of that. Sounds like you're leaning towards doing something about it. I only point that out for this reason. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of work looking at local, the, the contribution of local jurisdictions to education. And of course, this is one of the costs. Uh, you not only have to pay for your current teachers, and that, by the way, is a big part of the teacher pension contribution. Uh, but you have to meet the obligation for current uh, retirees. Um, everybody has loved the fact that we've put more money into education in the state. Since we passed Thornton in 2002, we have seen a 98% increase in the amount of money that the state gives to K-12 education. During that same period of time, we haven't added that many students to the school system, K-12 through school systems throughout the state. So just about double the amount that we put in, it's almost $6 billion now out of the general fund, which is only $14 billion. So it's almost half of what we spend on uh, out of the general fund every year. And I'll give you a good for instance. In St. Mary's County, before Thornton, the state picked up about 42% of the cost for educating one student in St. Mary's County. The county itself used to pay about 52% of that cost. And this is back in 2002. Today, the state pays 55%, so we've gone from 42 to 55%. The county's contribution has gone from paying about 52% to 38%. So we've totally reversed. And that really was not supposed to happen. So, um, Senator Miller points out that um, some counties um, contribute more to uh, teacher salaries and therefore the pensions are higher. So his argument is they're initiating it so they should take the responsibility for it. Is there some way of evening it out so that if the counties pay more, they're going to have to contribute uh, some versus maybe some of the counties that don't do that and therefore wouldn't have to. What we're looking at now <coughs> is the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the whole maintenance of effort issue. Okay. Maintenance of effort is, uh, if, if we go back, we talked about the budget dominating, being one of the dominant issues for the session. Um, specifically, maintenance of effort will be one of the chief topics that we're addressing. <coughs> excuse me, the speaker will likely put together a task force much like he did for the emergency uh, services. And uh, that's the group that I chair that uh, led to the funding for the replacement of the medevac helicopters. <clears throat> so the task force on maintenance of effort will work hard to look at the whole issue of, of uh, local effort, if you will, towards education. Uh, the law simply says that on a per pupil funding basis, you have to at least fund, uh, you have to fund at the same level that you did the year before. In other words, you can't buy, drop back. If you're paying $6,000 per student, you can't drop it back to $5,800 per student right. the next year. And of course, that means that you have to keep up with student growth, enrollment growth. Uh, fast growing jurisdictions like ours. You can be increasing your the amount that the, the county pays, uh, the, the whole amount for education, but then dropping back on a per, per pupil basis. The state maintenance of effort law says you can't do that. You have to keep up. There's a couple of factors. One is Montgomery County for years, it far exceeded their minimum contribution that they were required to meet by law. Then they had a major um, sort of perfect storm, which is a, a rapid increase in their student enrollment at the time that their wealth significantly dropped. So their revenues, their, their county revenues, dropped significantly. 
And they said, there's no way that we can meet the maintenance of effort this year, but we've been far exceeding it for many, many years. We need some relief here. Wicomico County on the Eastern Shore uh, has a county council that has significantly cut back funding on everything, including for education. Uh, they've got some tax caps in place. And they are looking at things as radical as going to a four-day uh, school week and other measures in order to save funding. They simply are saying, we don't have the money to put towards education. And there's several different jurisdictions who have, uh, uh, are, are saying that. Uh, from our perspective, <coughs> excuse me, from our perspective, we're going to be looking at the maintenance of effort in the sense of local effort. You know, how much... Uh, the state has, through some very challenging fiscal times, made it a priority to fund K-12 education, kept robust funding, even at a time when we were, we were second wind, uh, frankly. And uh, the local jurisdictions, most of them have tried to keep up with us, uh, but many of them have, their effort has been, uh, shall we say, uh, underwhelming. Okay, uh, you are on the uh, Appropriations Committee? So, appropriations. Um, and you're chair of the Education Subcommittee? Education and Economic Development Subcommittee. Great, great uh, tandem. Uh -huh. the, the two go hand in hand very nicely. Okay, pretty busy subcommittee? Very busy. Education is a big priority in the state. If you talk to our business community in the state, they say two things are really most important to them. Good transportation network, number, number one, good education system. And that's both K through 12 and increasingly higher education. And I assume that's particularly important in St. Mary's County. In the entire Southern Maryland region, I've argued to the chancellor of the university system that we have probably faster growing higher education needs than any other region because of Pax River, because of the transformation, if you will, of our region over the past two decades. Fastest growing region of the state for two decades in a row now, and yet the university system is not down here. So last year I put in a bill that took effect in October, and this year, or in 2012, we're going to be gearing up with the Southern Maryland Higher Education Council. The job of that group, and there's some very distinguished uh, participants in that, and there, it's, it's everything, everybody from the Assistant Secretary of the Navy uh, to the Chancellor of the University System to the College of um, Southern Maryland President, St. Mary's College President, Mel Powell, who runs our Regional Higher Ed Center. All of those stakeholders who have an interest, including in a very significant way the private sector, who will be re represented by the Workforce Investment Board, uh, all those stakeholders who have a, a, uh, an interest in a highly educated workforce are going to have to come together and figure out a game plan for the next five, ten years for Southern Maryland. Specifically, what our they need to identify what are the higher education needs for, uh, for this region. And what we anticipate is, what I've said to the University, of Syst uh, the University System of Maryland, the Chancellor, Fred Kerwin, again, the fastest growing region for two decades, and yet you're not really located in southern Maryland at all. Charles Calvert, St. Mary's County, if we want to access the university system, we have to drive north. College Park or Baltimore. And we need probably some bricks and mortar investment locally. We need an enhanced presence of the university system at the Regional Higher Ed Center. We need ultimately better access for our people for higher education. Uh, and the governor set some pretty aggressive goals for the state to have. Uh, 55% of our folks by the year 2020 uh, holding some form of post high school education, either a certificate of a one year certificate, uh, an AA degree, a bachelor's degree, or master's or doctorate. Currently, 
Maryland's so the state of Maryland has uh, about 44 percent of our folks all of that. So we need to go from 44 to 55 percent. There's no way that we can do that statewide unless Southern Maryland is a strong participant, and we're right for doing that. What is your preferred method of hearing from the public? Um, do you like uh, phone calls or regular mail or email, or does it make any difference? Increasingly, email works <laughs> works great. Um, you know, there's the old-fashioned method of being at the grocery store or the post office, and I run into a lot of people and uh, pick up things all the time uh, in that fashion. Uh, I mentioned to you before we started, I'm, I'm going to do some town hall meetings. Uh, once the session gets underway, we begin to identify what the uh, issues are, so I'm going to hear from people. Uh, still enjoy receiving a letter. To me, it's a, it says a lot when someone sits down and pens, actually pens a letter and sends it. And then, uh, you know, we get phone calls and, and uh, that uh, either at the district office here or in Annapolis. And, uh, I appreciate that. What is your uh, district office uh, phone number? 301-866-4000.